Hello everyone. I'm Professor Kate Bird and I'm really happy to introduce this, the fourth episode of the Power Shift Decolonizing Development with Professor Andres Dutoy and Charmaine McCauley, my co-host. Today, we're going to be talking about the land debate in South Africa. And linked to that, we're going to be talking about national identity and nationalism and how the land debate in South Africa is perhaps the manifestation of the unmended repercussions of settler colonialism and apartheid. Andres in this episode articulates how for him, very personal experiences and self-reflection, including through talking to other men, both white and black, has made it more possible for him to engage in the decolonization process. He also talks about best whiteism, which I think is a fantastic phrase and it's very evocative. And I think it's going to help me to change the way that I show up in this debate as well. And in that he's reflecting, I suppose, um, oh, white sensitivity and uh, white fragility and how many white people struggle to acknowledge and confront their own part in the colonial uh, and racist uh, structures that they're part of. So Andres also talks about uh, taking personal responsibility and how important taking personal responsibility is and how that needs to come from a place of self-reflection. He talks also about the importance of knowing when to stay silent and listen particularly as a white person in these debates. And he gives us all a really practical and doable first step to practical action, which I'm not going to tell you now. I challenge you to listen through to the end, because I think his suggestion will certainly contribute to my best efforts to show up properly in the decolonization space, both as a person in conversations and through my work. So this is a really meaty episode and it's delivered in Andres's accessible conversational style with Charmaine providing some really challenging and thought provoking questions. So I would encourage you to listen on and to see the show notes for more on Andres and on PLAS, the research institute that he belongs to, that he leads actually, and also uh, for the books and the groups that he mentions in the episodes. So enjoy the episode. Bye for now. Hi, welcome to The Power Shift, Decolonizing Development, the podcast series seeking to bring together thinkers, practitioners and activists to share ideas, inspire change and identify tools for practical action. I am Charmaine McCauley, a body psychotherapist, director of Kokoro, and lead facilitator of the groundbreaking training program, Racism in Real Time, a program that explores how BIPOC and white folks experience racialized interactions and provides them with the tools to show up differently. I'm also interested in decolonizing psychotherapy and the visceral impact that colonialism and privilege has on our racialized bodies. <clears throat> I'd like to take this opportunity now to introduce my co-host, wonderful Professor Kate Bird, Director of the Development Hub. Kate is a researcher who works on poverty, gender, and bottom-up growth. She was drawn to the topic of decolonizing development during COVID pandemic, when the way she worked had to radically change and in reflecting about how the Black Lives Matter movement should inform her work. Over to you, lovely Kate. Thanks, Charmaine. Oh. Today we're talking to Professor Andres de Toy. The speaker is the director of PLAS, the Institute of Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. He's a political economist who's published on the social relations of labour on commercial fruit and wine farms in the Western Cape, chronic and structural poverty, and the dynamics of marginalised livelihoods and informal social protection in migrant networks in the East and the Western. I've known Andres now for, gosh, over 20 years, and we worked as such as together on an international research project. So I know Andres of old, and it's really nice to be talking to him again today. If you'd like to know more about Andres, please click on the show notes below this episode 
and you'll find out more about him. But I'll pass now back to Charmaine, who's going to ask our first question. Yes, and I've just met Andres just recently, so this has been a lovely opportunity to get to know you better. So our first question to you is, what work have you done in terms of personal transformation to enable you to work confidently on decolonization, especially because whether you like it or not, you do carry the legacy of your ancestors who were brutal colonizers? Yes, I wouldn't say I work confidently. Okay. I think in a way I've been, I'm very aware of the particular history to, that I carry with me as a, as a descendant of white settlers. The Detroit's have been around in South Africa since about 1689. They were huge. And uh, I think to, to some extent, I've often been in, in denial about what that history meant. And then some years ago, my grandfather wrote his autobiography, of which like three, three copies came out, one for each of the sons or something like that. He recounted the early history of our family in the uh, early days of this colonial settlement. And I was, I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was to see just how implicated our family had been in colonialism, with red in tooth and claw. They were very much part of the, the original processes of genocide and disposition that, that created this economy. It, it shouldn't have been a shock to me, but it was. My family is a family of kind of dissident Afrikaners have always been opposed to apartheid and I'd always somehow had the idea that somehow we were we were we didn't have such dirty hands as the rest of white South Africans and that illusion was rudely shattered but for some reason I think how I got to be involved in land and agricultural issues at all some of it is simply a matter of coincidence and historical accident but I always go back to a uh, day when I must have been quite a small little boy, probably four or five years old, on my grandfather's small holding outside Craddock. And somebody had done something wrong. I think a gate had been left open and the cattle had gotten out into the Lucerne. And my grandfather summoned all the farm workers together and gave them a, a sort of a long talking to. And I remember looking at them and looking at him and thinking, this is not even touching sides because I know what it's like to be given a talking to by him. And they were just standing there sullenly waiting for the white man to finish. And I suppose that image of people talking past each other and living past each other has long mm -hmm. has remained in my being somewhere. So that I, many years later, came to find that I was doing a PhD about the relationship between black farm workers and white farmers. And how does it happen that Black farm workers seem to accept the legitimacy of the relationships that were oppressing them and seem to not be resisting and not be rebelling and standing up against oppression. So I've always felt very much part of the whole drama implicated in the in the terrible um, conflict between white overlords and black subjects and servants in South Africa, as it was, white people always having the identity of, of mastery and black people automatically being consigned to servitude and those are identities that are still with us today i can speak to a black person in the eastern cape on the phone and they will still address me as sir for absolutely no reason other than that they either know i'm a white person would you ask me what is it that um that enables me to to work confidently or not on this and how i deal with a legacy of brutal colonialism. I think one fortunate privilege I had is that for a long time I was married to a black woman. We parted our ways many years ago, for better or for worse, but it was a crash course in the reality, in the embodied reality in, in, in racism even today, even after the end of apartheid. So I learned early on how just trying to pretend that it's all happened elsewhere and all happened in the past doesn't just cut it. And about the need to try to find a way of having a relationship, having a conversation that's not just a reiteration of a previous algorithms. And I think another thing that I find very useful is for many years, I was part of something called the Mankind Project. I don't know whether you've come across it. It's a kind of a progressive men's network seeking to empower men into 
positive ways of in, inhabiting masculinity. And it came to South Africa via the United States. And it tried to create a place where men can address each other openly and be vulnerable with each other. And lo and behold, in South Africa, it meant that white men and black men had to actually be honest with each other about how they felt about each other and sit in the fire of some very uncomfortable feelings. So I suppose that's a very useful thing to have, to learn how to have, is to how to be with the kind of sometimes unbearable, uncomfortable feelings of anxiety or shame or rage that come up when you, when I suddenly see a picture of myself in the mirror that's actually not very flattering and not aligned with how I want to be. So I think those are some of the resources that I still find very useful now when we're dealing with extremely hot and charged and difficult issues relating to whiteness and blackness and the legacy of land dispossession and how to deal with it. Thank you. I'm just I'm going to ask you another question. Since the transition to democracy, and we can debate what kind of democracy we're talking about, but I'll let the word stand. It has been widely accepted in South Africa that the resolution to the land question is essential if South Africa is to have a peaceful and prosperous future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why then has land reform in South Africa particularly been so beset with problems? Why does it seem so difficult to resolve more than 25 years after liberation. Yeah, it's something that is very much with us still, and particularly in over the last four or five years, it has very much come to the foreground. I would say, in a way, there are a number of ready-made answers to this question. If you speak to many South Africans over the last five years, the answer would be that the problem is the constitution. Sure. Uh, that the constitution entrenches a right to property and that the right to property makes it impossible to uh, expropriate or to cheaply expropriate white farmers who have been one of the beneficiaries of apartheid and colonial dispossession. And that therefore what we need to do is to amend the constitution so as to make appropriation without compensation possible. And that is the way in which many people understand it. The difficulty with that answer is that it's if you look at the constitution it doesn't make expropriation without compensation impossible the constitution specifically allows expropriation for the purposes of land reform and if justice and equity demands that compensation should be zero the constitution allows for it and furthermore if you look at the facts of the matter the cost of land expropriation has not been a major obstacle to land restitution at all. The reason why land reform is not happening is more because the basic policies and programs that have been set in place for land reform are fundamentally unworkable. So a second kind of answer is to say the problem lies at the level of inappropriate policy. And there's a kind of a debate. I'm not going to go into the details. On the one hand, and the kind of a right-wing neoliberal side of the debate, there are the people who say all you need to do is deracialize the agricultural sector, get a few more black capitalist farmers in to change the kind of public face of agriculture, but essentially keep the, the structure, which is very concentrated, very industrialized, dependent on fossil fuels and agrochemicals and strongly linked into relations with supermarkets, where the supermarkets are very powerful and basically set the tone determine the prices and so on. And on the left side of the debate, which is where my institute stands, to say, no, what we need is a fundamental transformation of the agri-food system, change the way in which agriculture is done. There's 200,000 smallholder farmers. There's 2 million people doing subsistence agriculture. And land reform should be about then. And around that debate goes and has gone for the last 25, 28 years without any resolution. And I suppose more and more, it has seemed to me that policy debate misses the point, because in a way, I don't think the land question in South Africa, as it is understood, as it plays out and what drives it, is, is amenable to policy resolutions of this kind, because it's actually not a policy question. It's a far more emotional and political question. I think, I mean, in a way, to make it quite simple or kind of concrete, 
a few years ago, we had quite a wave of a, a radicalized young black students at South African universities known as the Fees Must Fall movement, the fallists. I don't know whether you've heard about them in the UK, very strongly sort of questioning the legacy of colonialism in South African universities. And these young people would say things like, just give us the land first and then we can talk. There shouldn't even be a negotiation about this. Just give us the land. And the interesting thing to me is that these young people were A, extremely passionate about this, but B, they did not seem to me to have any desire to actually own any land. They were not wanting to do agriculture. They wanted law degrees or, or degrees in, in commerce. They wanted to have paying urban jobs, and they should. So land was not about land. It seemed to be a symbol of something much more powerful and charged than the question of who should be farming and how should our farming sector look. And it seemed to me that what when people talk about the land question, they're actually talking about a much, it's a kind of a symbol of a bigger and deeper injustice, which is the fact that 25 years, 28 years after the transition to democracy in South Africa, we still have a situation which is deep racialized inequality. The vast majority of poor of black people in South Africa feel like second class citizens in their own country and have to live lives without dignity, lives in which citizenship actually doesn't really mean very much because there's not enough food on the table and because they might be evicted from the place where they are at any moment in time. And it's that injustice. It's really the betrayal of the promise of emancipation, the betrayal of the promise of freedom that's going on here. So that, so in a way, the land question is really the national question. The land question is not who should own that farm over there, but who does this country belong to and who belongs in this country? And that's an extremely charged and heated and difficult question. And a question that's in a way been taboo in the Rainbow Nation. You're not supposed to ask that question. We're all supposed to join our hands and sing Kumbaya and forget the past and so on. So it's, a, it's an incredibly important question being asked in a kind of indirect, displaced way. And I think that's really where we need to focus our attention to that underlying unstated question. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. I'll jump in with the next question. Andres, I'm really enjoying listening to you teasing apart these issues and the kind of reflective approach you're taking to them. But how do you think South Africans more broadly have tended to deal with these contentious mm. and charged questions, both inside and outside the land debate? How do you think that South Africans should deal with the emotional and charged unspoken issues that flicker through the debate uh, on land? Yeah, thank you. One way to deal with this, something like this is just denial. It's, it works a lot of the time. And a lot of people who have been involved in the land debate are very aware of the kind of supercharged political and emotional undertones to the land question and, and just how troubling those questions are. And then the response is often to say those questions are dangerous. Those questions are irresolvable. They are being exploited by opportunist populist politicians for vote garnering purposes. And what we should do as, as responsible South Africans is to put all those emotions aside and look at the, the rational ways in which one can make policy sense out of this debate. And then that can become a kind of almost like a gaslighting process in which you try to avoid or sidestep and ignore the real and current experiences of trauma, anger and injustice that are informing the debate and think that you can out outwit it or finesse it or evade it or avoid it. And the difficulty with that process is that it can work up to a point, but the re repressed has a kind of habit of returning. And in a way, this is what we have seen in the more recent period of discussion about the land debate is in a way that it's not been possible to finesse the underlying extremely disruptive energies of the colonial debate by trying to make it all about the most rational use of agricultural land or the creation of jobs. Another way of dealing with it is to, in a way, go into various kinds of vengeful or reparative 
fantasies, which I think in a way, I think that's where the demand for expropriation without compensation comes from. It's a demand that somebody should pay. Somebody has to be punished or has got to feel the pain. Even if it, even if you were personally implicit in apartheid, even if you maybe just came to South Africa recently and you bought a farm and paid money for it, even if you don't have kind of blood in your hands, we don't care. Um, somebody's got to um, suffer. Or you can have a kind of a reparative fantasy, which you often get on the kind of political left, that we're, we're the people who are going to make it all right again and try to sort of... And I think both eventual and the reparative fantasy is in a way of uh, trying to make the past unhappen. Can we find a way of pressing a reset button, which will just make the past disappear, and then we can go into the future that we'd rather have? I don't know whether there is an alternative, but I'm very interested in, is there a way of talking about it which is not trying to make the past unhappen, and which is also not trying to deny the injustice or the trauma of the past, but which is in a way more about acknowledging damage done, accounting the damage done, and trying to figure out how does one live and how do people live in the aftermath of the absolute disastrous injustice? I, I hesitate to use the word Holocaust because it's so charged, but the inhuman disaster that, that colonialism was in a way that does not perpetuate or reinscribe it again. And that's, I think, a difficult job and I don't have any clear answers there, but it seems to me that's the place where we need to start. Is what remains of the notion of a South African nation, of a South African people, and how can we think of the South African people without trying to erase or trying to deny the reality of, of the legacy of colonialism as it was in the past, and without fantasizing that it could just be all washed clean through some act of retribution or absolution. I think those are some very interesting reflections there. And to come clean, I'm also from Huguenot and Africana heritage. I was actually born in Pretoria, but raised largely in the UK and have a British passport and consider myself now to be British. But I grew up thinking of myself as a white South African. And it was only when I visited South Africa for the first time after I left. So I left at four, went back at 18 to visit relatives. It was only when I went back, that I realised just how British I had become. I had a British sensibility, British sense of humour, British expectations in terms of justice and human rights and all of that kind of stuff. And then my first boyfriend had been black, my second boyfriend had been. So I realised in terms of upbringing how British I'd been, but I don't think it's been possible ever for me to erase the, um, the history of my family. It's, it's something I've reflected on a lot. And that's one of the reasons that I'm interested in, in, in hosting this podcast, because I think for me, certainly identity is a very layered thing. It's layered and it can shift over time. So it was only as an adult that I discovered that my paternal grandfather was mixed race. And that again, shifted things for me. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's why I never needed sun cream as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's those silly things like that. But it was later that I did the calculation and worked out that during the time of slavery, I would have been a slave. And then it's, oh, because then you look at the world again, slightly differently. So for me, sort of identity is layered and can shift. But thinking about South Africa, I've often thought about it as almost a post conflict state with the era of apartheid being a suppressed but intense conflict and you talk about trauma and looking at my own family but also my experiences when I visited South Africa there's a sense of of psychological ill-being from the impact of mm -hmm. denial denying the reality that you're living in denying that the person who pretty much raised you as a child who was black mm -hmm. is now somebody who as an adult you don't talk to I think there's a lot in South Africa I think there's a lot of kind of fracture and denial or at least that that's that's what I've seen it and given the reality of colonialism and its aftermath in South Africa do you think it's actually possible to decolonize the South African identity yeah, I don't know there's only one way to find out and that's to try I think it's very interesting how it's tempting it is to try to find little sources of absolution. I'm very aware that many Afrikaans people will take great pleasure in pointing out how just how bad the British were 
and try to argue that, well, actually, racism was originally invented by the Brits. We just perfected it, maybe. I don't know. But And also how our family also has some intermarriage with black and slave people in the past, but I don't think it allows me to retroactively launder or change where I'm standing in this debate. I think I think when there's a number of things going on here, I think, I mean, you can talk about it in a, at a personal level, how I stand about as about as a white man, but I think there's also a broader political level. And so maybe you can start stand with that and then we can go to the more personal issue a little bit later. I think I'm very interested by this notion of emancipation and about the notion that the constitution of 1994 was a betrayal and that the real emancipation of South Africa still has to happen. I think it's a very powerful and evocative notion. And at the same time, I think there are ways in which the debate around emancipation in South Africa at the moment risks repeating the colonial moment. The notion of one way of thinking about emancipation is very much a European Enlightenment notion of emancipation, which is that emancipation is the liberation of somebody from external shackles. I used to be free, now I am in chains and I have to throw off my chains to become free again. And in the European tradition, that tradition of emancipation was always the emancipation of a people that was ethnically and linguistically defined. France for the French and Germany for the Germans. That was the whole tradition of throwing off the yoke of the Habsburg empire. And to some extent, that's what my, quote unquote, my people, the Afrikaners did, is that they took that ethno-racial emancipatory discourse and turned it into a tool of oppression. And I think, in a way, there's some difficulties with trying to do that now. And I think one of the difficulties that we have at the moment in the world is that the notion of emancipation only takes you so far in a situation where so many of the problems that we have are problems of coexistence in a complex and brutal world from which we can't step aside. There's some people who fantasize about going off grid, but that's only the most wealthy and right wing among us can actually ever hope to secede to our little Bitcoin islands and go off grid in that sense. The rest of us have to live here in a, in this unfolding eco-crisis that we see around us. And the ethno-nationalist bit is, has never really worked particularly well in sub-Saharan Africa. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the political traditions of pre-colonial Africa, when there were strong and deep traditions of statecraft and politics, but they were never founded on this ethno-nationalist template. There were always traditions of the Zulu empire was not a uh, empire in which you had to become Zulu or had to speak Zulu. And neither it was the Kosa kingdom, a, a kingdom that enforced a Kosa ethnic identity. It was a kind of um, in, a process of incorporating different people and working out relationships of cohabiting. And it was a much more multicultural approach to political identity. So there's very powerful traditions in South Africa that hark back to that tradition. And I think actually, if you look at the South African constitution, the preamble, um, which is a language you get from this from the Freedom Charter, says that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, which is, a, on the one hand, a kind of, it's a quite a nice, inspiring, liberal idea. But it's also quite a shocking statement to say, because it says that the descendants of those from whom the land was stolen shall live in, or maybe not in peace and harmony, but in a relationship of political equality and moral equality with the descendants of those who stole the land. And that's a radical thing to say. In, in a way, I don't know whether it's a retroactive legitimization of colonialism, but it is saying colonialism happened and the people who have been created by it, white and black, have to find a way of living together. It's almost going back to what you said a few moments ago, this idea that people almost want to draw a line, to mm. draw a line under mm. history and say, OK, yeah, history happened, but let's all be friends now and hold hands and move yeah. forwards together. Yeah. 
So that bit of the constitution, no. it's almost doing that. Let's just say that we are one people and let's all be friends and develop the country together, moving forwards together. Well, I think that line can be interpreted in two ways. There's a kind of a liberal interpretation, which is that let's just be friends and draw a line. But there's a different way of interpreting, which is to say that South Africans don't exist. And this is the idea I get from Ivor Chipkin, who wrote a book called Do South Africans Exist? And the answer is South Africans don't exist, except in the places where South Africans strive to address each other in relationships of solidarity and trying to build a country in which equality can be real. So in other words, South Africa is not a given. South Africa is something that still has to be made. And it is the responsibility of white and black South Africans to make it. And that making cannot be a painless process. It is a making that would have to involve a, a lot of truth telling and a lot of cost accounting. It's not a debate in which white people can just say, okay, it was me. It is a place where where I have to take responsibility for my own privilege and I have to understand the consequences of generations of abjection and denial. And I think it's the beginning of a very difficult and a painful uh, conversation. And I think it's not just about joining hands and saying kumbaya. I'll give you an example of what I think it could mean. And I'll take it back to land. Not far from where I live, there's a working class suburb called Woodstock. It's a place where black people, colored people, as they were called under apartheid times, were able to hold on to some land in the urban center, close to the city center. So it's a working class suburb. And there's a large hospital, Woodstock Hospital, which has been standing empty for many years. And some time ago, it was occupied by poor black people who want jobs or have jobs in the city, but who don't want to live in the kind of poor ghettos to which black people have been relegated in the post-apartheid society, which is where all the cheap land is so far away from Cape Town that you're almost in the sea. So they've occupied the hospital, they live there, and they have said in their occupation, what we're doing is not illegally stealing something that belongs to government. We are creating value, what used to be an empty hospital where you know you would be scared of your daughter walking past at night and where drug dealers and other unsavory elements hung out and made life dangerous there's now a community living so we are creating social value by occupying this land and by insisting on our right to be here because where else would we go and so now there's actually a debate happening in woodstock and i think that kind of there are parts of the woodstock ratepayers association that are saying, actually, we are also quite worried about gentrification and who are, it seems to be that there might be the possibility of, for a kind of a discussion of, of accepting the validity of occupiers of public land to be there. And that means that we need to start saying what happens to sanitation, what happens to municipal services. And the same is true here in my neighborhood, Hot Bay, which is a wealthy white suburb that 30 years ago was occupied by poor black people who quote unquote squatted the land and who have resisted attempts to be displaced and whose legal right to live here has now been recognized by, by government. But what does it mean beyond that? If we in White Hot Bay um, accept the right of poor black people to live here, then we should also look at the conditions in which they're living here. Why is it that the township of Imizama Yeto or, or Mandela Park, as it's known by its residents, still does not have proper sanitation so that raw sewage runs into the river and into the sea? So we, we can't just point a finger at government and say, they have to solve it. We live here and we're wealthy. So there needs to be a discussion of what can we do to be part of the solution? So I think in a way, it's about saying that the South Africa that we want is still possible, but the answer, as Linton Quincy Johnson used to say, lies at our own gate. And and I think if we're not willing to go there, then the consequence will be further polarization and descent into bitterness and fantasies of revenge and absolution. But I think the possibility is there of making, uh, of, of, a, of a politics of solidarity 
Yeah, I was just about to say it sounds it sounds to me as what you're talking about there is about sort of individual responsibility to reflect and transform, but also to engage in collective action and solidarity with others. So rather than othering people who are poorer or people who are of different ethnicities to actually try to try to not just build Mm. bridges, but to create an economic smoothing so you don't have these huge inequalities and inequalities of well-being and yeah. comfort yeah and what is but not an option is to is to withdraw yeah but what is not an option is for me to withdraw into my gated community and to try to create a little pod of safety and security just for me and mine that is not something that that has any future as far as i can see okay we were just going to hear from Charmaine. I'm interested, Andre, to hear about how you navigate issues around, I think we just already talked about it a little bit, around legitimacy in the South African context. And how do you engage with these issues and land reform and race colonity as a white man? And I want to add a little bit to that and look at it from a kind of a black and brown perspective. When I think about race, uh, um. I don't just think about as me as the individual. I look at the collective that comes with me, right? The institutions that make it difficult for me to live, the systemic denial of health care. So it's a collective. It's like it's a huge force that's there. And I often think that when whites talk about it, they think of it just themselves as an individual. I don't think they actually give credence to the reason why white people can do what they do is because they've got full backup. So when I say as a white man, I also want you to kind of talk about what what gives you the legitimacy to do what you want to do or do what you don't want to do. So I don't want you to just talk about I as the individual because for black people, we don't see it that way. So when we get mm-hmm. hurt, we don't say you did it. We say mm-hmm. there's a whole cast of characters mm-hmm. that enabled a white person to hurt me. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah, I just, for some reason, I just had a flashback to a moment during the transition from apartheid in which the South African post office had for the first time been deracialized. So black people and white people were queuing together and in the same, standing in the same queues. And in a way that was no big deal. But I remember a moment which I thought, was there a way in which unconsciously I had all my life been relying on that notion of having that invisible backup there? And I had to admit to myself that I had. And in a way, the choice to stay in South Africa was the choice to to be willing to give up that backup. But the backup is still there in the form of wealth, yeah. self-confidence, privilege, etc. So your question is how to deal with legitimacy and... I guess it's partly recognizing that it's not just the individual as a, the question is, as a white man. And I'm saying, how do you do that with the invisible stuff that, it's not invisible to the black and brown person. We deal with that. But you say it's invisible to you. So even to talk about that, that Mm -hmm. you have all this stuff with you, you carry it with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And with that army, let's say, how do you then deal with this? Yeah, I'm, uh, I can I can only answer about the th- little bits that I know about. I think one common, I mean, I mean, accepting the reality of complicity and privilege is not an easy thing. And I think that one big temptation for myself and for others is to, in a way, do a kind of not all white people move. So that's what uh, there's a South African journalist, Rebecca Davis, who wrote a book called something like Best White and Other Anxieties. And it's this notion trying to be the best white. We know that oh, it's terrible people. And look at those people over there. Aren't they dreadful? But I'm not like that. Yeah. Uh, and that inevitably has to involve some degree of deception and d- dishonesty and disavowal. And it can also allow a situation and this is one of the things that i struggle with a lot in our sector where we can think that because we are on the left side of the ideological spectrum we are allowed to just boss people around yeah. i'm often struck by how easy it is for people who regard themselves as socialists and marxists to insist on their 
class privilege and their and to use their racialized self-confidence without giving it a second thought so that is part of the the ter- terrain that we're on so for me it's been a long process of simply accepting the complicity and therefore often knowing that it's not about me if there's a debate happening sometimes i just need to let other people go into the debate and listen and maybe intervene when I think it's useful or say something when I think it's useful and resisting those moments of best whiteism. And in a way, I think one of the things that us white academics have had to unlearn is the fantastic vantage point on the Mount Olympus that theory gives us. So I actually think one of the functions of of development policy discourse is it allows us to, it's a defense mechanism. It allows us to talk about all of this stuff as if we're not really part of it, but sitting, looking down at it from a distance. And I think coming down from Mount Olympus means coming down into a place where sometimes I listen to the debate happening and learn from it. Or sometimes I, and also sometimes I have to be willing to let somebody hold up a mirror in quite an unpleasant or painful way and just not squirm too much. And I think also the other thing is in in South Africa, I think I'm often struck by how different the relationship between white and black feels to me when I'm in the US or in the UK than when I'm here. I feel that in South Africa, there's maybe, I make this up, but I've, I think there's a lot of tiny little ways in which if black and white meet below the level of consciousness, there seems to be that there's some sort of signaling going on. What are you? Are you one of those or are you one of those? How are you going to be with me? So that it's possible to communicate with relative ease. And I I feel when I speak to a Black South African, I'm not automatically assumed to be one of those really racist whites, which are still in, in plentiful supply. And it's always struck to... Uh, uh, I think there's all kinds of ways of getting along and negotiating relationships that happens below the level of the discursive, maybe in body language, maybe in, I don't know, just how people speak to each other that that allow people to negotiate and find whatever legitimacy there there is. But it, it doesn't mean the discomfort ever goes away. And I think I'm always aware of just how I mean you Charmaine you're being very nice and friendly and accommodating so I feel safe in this discussion with you but I'm often aware of just how how quickly it can feel charged for me and by extension if it feels charged for me when just a little thing wobbles or something goes slightly amiss and I suddenly feel hectically uncomfortable, how much more intense and this uh, unsettling must it be for a person who doesn't come with all my layers of protection and privilege and entitlement. And not only am I white, but I'm the eldest son in Afrikaans family, in which I'm the only son with three sisters. Now, those are levels of crown princedom of which only few people can dream. So yeah, I'm often aware of how safe I actually um, yeah. And I think we, I don't know, I, I still feel that we only really scratch the surface in, in our engagement around these issues in South Africa. Thank you. I just wanted to add, so with that level of safety that you mm-hmm. have, I think it, it's even more difficult to risk that mm-hmm. to, let's say, to come and join me on my side. Because from what you've just mm-hmm. said, to give up that level of safety, that level of comfort, that level of support that you get Mm. with the invisible backing that you say, Mm. my sense is then, Mm. and as sitting across, I really feel, Mm. I really feel in my body, that level of safety. And my question in turn is how willing is he to give up that level of safety? So to me, it's like, what is the risk for you, right? In in these everyday situations Mm. to say, not just to say, but to actively move your body, your soul, mm-hmm. your heart, and come and align with mm-hmm. me, mm-hmm. stay with me, hold my hand, be yeah. be sister to sister, brother to brother, face to face, back to yeah. back. So mm-hmm. that's one of the things I'm often aware of in these kinds of situations. Mm-hmm. I'm always thinking, what's the risk? What's the risk? What's the risk? Yeah, the risk 
is often what the perceived risk mm. or the experience risk is feelings of discomfort, shame, pain, that I'm not as, as I'm not the rescuer or I'm not the hero or I'm not the nice white guy that I think I am seeing myself in the distorted reflection of somebody else's so that's that is the perceived risk the the reality i think in a way the question is there might be a kind of a defensive response to that i think the beyond that risk is the possibility of a, a real relationship of um learning something about seeing the world through eyes that are not mine so i don't know whether that's the risk or what the reward. I'm very aware of how I have to watch out against my, I often get extremely angry at white people who are, in my view, unconscious. And I think what's driving my feelings of judgmental and anger is like, who does that remind you of? Yeah, I think the risk is there's a, a lot of real and imagined rage. And the fear is of being rejected. And also th th there's a fear of annihilation that either the angry person will either in reality or psychologically reject me and deprive me of my, my... I'm a progressive intellectual. I'm one of the good guys. And I've stacked my whole reputation and my career and my identity on being one of the good people. And good people... Whether it's real or not. Yeah, and good people, good people, nice people hold the gun to my head and they don't know they yeah. got the gun. So, yeah. yeah, so that's difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andres. I would, I'd like to wrap up now with just a simple question, which is given the nuanced and sensitive picture that you have mm -hmm. presented us with, what would you say our listeners and viewers can do? What is one practical thing that they can do mm. to help to contribute to mm. the process of decolonization and either in their personal lives or mm. in their professional lives? Mm. One practical takeaway. The first thing that pops into my head is don't ever say we. I'm struck by it when I read like progressive opinion how tempting it is to imagine that I'm speaking for all of humanity. What we need to do, what we want, what we need, especially like at the moment around climate change, there's this tendency of the part of people, quite progressive people to think, now we are talking here about the planet and about the needs of future generations. And I'm trying saying I for a change. Uh, one formative experience for me was when I was a war resistor. Uh, we were conscientious objectors. And I was a conscious objector, not only because I didn't want to kill for apartheid, but be also because I didn't want to die for apartheid. And uh, there was a slogan that I remember from the anti-Vietnam uh, resistance, the resist imperialism, the life you save may be your own. And I think it is very healthy for people to, for me, to be quite honest about what's in it for me. What am I? trying to be free of here? What am I trying to change for me rather than imagine that I'm, I'm can position myself on the good side of the moral continuum and inhabit that place if I just wear the right badges and sign the right declarations or use the right language. So yeah, don't say we, say I. That would be one thing that I would very much encourage. I think that's, that's really nice, Andres, because it's reinforcing the idea that we actually this whole process starts with ourselves and it starts with a process of personal transformation and mm. and a lot of what you have said is that it we're not necessarily there yet as individuals it's mm. a process it's a process of increasing awareness it's a process of learning it's a process of listening and engaging yeah. so I, I i like that and i'll very much try to apply that in my own life because i'm guilty of writing and saying we, because I think I like the idea of being part of a collective and feeling that I'm part of a positive, progressive, collective process of change. And I definitely like to see yeah. myself as one of the, the good guys, yeah. but I obviously have to yeah. continue that process of increasing self-awareness and use I. So I'd like to draw this session to a close and mm. to thank you for talking to Charmaine and myself and to say goodbye to our listeners and viewers. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you very much.
And thank, thank you, you Patty. Thank, thank you, you Shaman. And thank you for your challenging questions. I really. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you.